Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host, Kerrigan. Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to Wedge Talk. My name is Kerrigan and today we are beginning another series of Wedge Talk shows and uh, we have a hiatus of almost a month. Um, you know, we all have to have a little rest once in a while and that was what we did. Uh, we are beginning this new series in September with a very interesting guest today to talk about uh, the secret brotherhoods and their influence in America. Very interesting topic, a very interesting man that we're going to talk with in a few uh, seconds. Now, before we go any further with this, I just wanted to uh, welcome everyone in the chat room. We have a lot of people on the chat room right now. Um, everyone is welcome to actually um, uh, uh, you know, put, put questions in there and, you know, uh, along the, the course of the show. Um, other than that, you know, I just wanted to uh, say to you, enjoy the show, and we're going to jump right in the introduction to our guest today. Here we go. Adam Pafre is an American journalist, editor, and the publisher of Federal House Books, whose work in all three capacities frequently centers on unusual, extreme, or forbidden areas of knowledge. Parfre has been targeted on several occasions by fundamentalist Christian activists and by concerned individuals who dislike the published material coming from Feral House. However, one of his goals is not merely to educate or entertain, but to unsettle and perhaps upset certain segments of the population. Parfrey has said that upsetting people is a beautiful thing because it gets people to think beyond their last visit to 7-Eleven. There's a lot about this world to be upset about. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my guest today, an author of Ritual America, Secret Brotherhoods and Their Influence on American Society, Adam Parfrey. <laughs> Hello, Adam. How are you? Great, Karen. Thanks for having me on. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, it's my pleasure. Now, I, I was uh, talking uh, with you a little bit behind the curtains, as I say, you know, preparing for the show. And I was set to you, I said to you, you know, you, 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 you are known as, and this is my <laughs> expression, the enfant terrible of the, of the publishers, um, or, or, you know, in, in a very uh, wide sense. But, you know, you are uh, known as publishing very uncomfortable books that people really kind of feel a little bit upset about. And you wrote somewhere, or you said some of, to someone that, you know, it's good, it's good to people to be upset because when they are upset, they're actually begin to think and they forget that last visit to 7-eleven and you know turns things a little bit more interesting and there's a lot of things in this country that we need to be upset about and <laughs> do you still think so yes I yeah I, I said that I, I hope that doesn't seem to um, um, overweening or selfish or whatever because I, I don't really think about changing everybody and all things and I'm trying to reflect what I am personally interested in and what I think um, should be addressed or looked at but um, in any case I, I'm so glad I do what I do because it keeps life very interesting and I, I'm able to absorb a lot of different subject matter I'm sure just like you are able to do with your show Yes, absolutely. It's great. I mean, you know, I have so many people from so many different 
areas of the occult, and not 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 even sometimes sometimes people don't don't have anything to do with the occult, and it's really it's really interesting. Now I I am very curious about um, your path until here. I mean, Adam, how did you begin in all of this? I know that you were raised in Manhattan, right, New York. Is that true? I was born in Manhattan because yeah. my, uh, my my father and mother were involved with uh, Broadway stage plays and yes. live television way back in the fifties, and yes. then my uh, then every all the actors and directors were moving out west where the TV shows were getting filmed and then videotaped and the live TV programs. So I was brought out with them as a little tyke. And uh, grew up prim primarily in L.A. area, yeah. and uh, moved on from there to various places. Moved back to New York, moved up to Portland, Oregon, moved down to San Francisco, <laughs> and L.A. again. And now I'm up in the uh, Port Townsend area of the Olympic Peninsula, in very northerly portion of uh, Washington State. Oh wow! Well. In all of this moving, I'm sure that there is a line here that goes from Manhattan to today that you, that can link all of these experiences and places that you went through. When did you begin to be interested in all of this? I mean, in all of these very uncomfortable subjects, things that are not really talked about, um, and now this wonderful book that you have, Ritual America, Secret Brotherhoods in their influence in the American society, which is absolutely amazing. Now, when did you begin to be interested in these things? Well, um, I'm going to be honest about all this. Um, <laughs> sometimes it's uncomfortable to be honest about it all, uh, because uh, I'll say something about myself that an outsider would think, that doesn't look so great, you know. So I got off, I understood and absorbed unorthodox subjects because at one point in my life, not now or not in the last 20, 25 years, I used to do drugs. Mm -hmm. And in those, when I took those drugs and I was on a downward slope from that, I would do nothing except read books and absorb new information. And, um, you know, and, and mm -hmm. I looked into various things in the occult and other things. And uh, as a result, I had a big interest. And in, also in early punk rock days, I had friends in that whole subject, like um, Genesis Porridge, um, who, who did a group called Throbbing Gristle and other people in the so-called industrial music area. Mm -hmm. They also looked into various subjects at uh, writers like Brian Geisen and Dream Machines and uh, William Burroughs and uh, aspects, societal aspects that aren't normally addressed to Democrat or Republican parties per se. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that that was really the start. And I had a job actually, and when I was living in San Francisco. Um, you know how some people go to Goodwills and the, they sort through all the donations and find stuff to resell? Well, I saw one morning that they had huge dumpster loads of books that they were dumping into uh, trucks to take them out to the, to the county dump. <laughs> and I, I said, well, I, I went to the manager of the store. I said, how do you sort through these things? What do you keep in the store? Because the store had these, you know, dismal, bad little paper, mass market paperback books like, you know, romances and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, he said, well, we keep the nice and shiny books and we throw everything else out. <laughs> I said, well, you got to pay to the dump to throw that out, right? Well, I will, uh, I convinced him to allow me through them or take them away. He says, you have to just dump them into your truck if you bring a truck. So I bought a pickup truck and I um, and I spent the next couple years sorting through books on a daily basis. Tons of books. 
And uh, I had a really good uh, learning experience from that about uh, learning about all the various titles that were available and also going through books that were, you know, as old as the 19th century and all that. Wow. Magazines and other stuff to see what was, uh, that was, what was considered saleable in a bookstore or not. And it was a great learning experience for publishing. And um, I did that before I ever got into publishing. So, That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So your love for books came from you know, a transaction, actually, you know, a, kind of a, a little bit of a transaction. Now, um, what about your cult? Are you interested in your cult at all? Absolutely interested in the occult, and it was, mm. you know, a life-changing experience, really, to go through the works of Aleister Crowley and uh, Manly Hall, Manly Palmer Hall, and we also published a book about Manly's life called Master of the Mysteries. Yes. And uh, he did the secret teachings of all age, of the ages, and that was a, a, a big book for me early on, and um, I I understood. I was reading about the uh, 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 Queen Elizabeth and John D. And in more recent times, I I published a book about Jack Parsons, the uh, one of the founders of Jet Propulsion Laboratories, who is also a very uh, devoted uh, occultist. And what happened in his life? It's a really incredible and fascinating story. Yeah. Now, uh, I don't know if people who are listening to us know this, but uh, Adam is actually um, has a publisher company. It's called feralhouse.com. So if you go to feralhouse.com, you can just see the titles. There are many titles. And, and you know, I just have to say that um, sometimes the internet the internet presence of the of the you know the sites the websites of, of uh, publishers are really not that nice um, feral house has a beautiful website and it's really beautiful well sorted out I mean it, everything is you know you, you really want to buy <laughs> that's what it is which is a good thing I guess um, but it's beautiful it's a very beautiful site with everything as it should be in um, and easy for you to find things out so uh, just go feralhouse.com f-e-r-a-l and then house.com so um and and all of this all of these things i mean why did you wrote the ritual america why was it important for you to write this book well um again it was one of those things i sort of ran into uh just face to face i would go to these stores, these second-hand stores, and I see mm -hmm. the, uh, the jewelry and the iconography of these groups, and I didn't really understand what I was looking at, and that provoked me, because I don't like not understanding things. I want to research <laughs> and see what's going on. And then yeah. when you drive into a town or a city, um, you will see this board and they will have all these kind of occult-looking symbols, and they would have a meeting for this club or that club. Or for, and I think, what is that, really? I was just, it would provoke me to think that. And then I would find, um, due to eBay, <clears throat> and that, you know, came through the last decade or, or so, that there was, you can find a lot looking through that and particularly before there was this little fad about the Freemasonry brought on by uh, books of Dan Brown and others for a while yes. and so so it, it was it, and then I found this one um, suit uh, from that group called the Knight Templars um, they like to march around and wear these uniforms and they have marching patterns and these big big books about what they were. They were like the Knights of Pythias and other groups at the time that were Masonic but not actually uh, belonged to the York Rite or the Scottish Rite orders, but they were their own thing. They're yes. kind of offshoots yes. of Freemasonry. So uh, I, I had one of these costumes and a, a satirical magazine at the time. It was 
I think it was called The Nose. It was out of uh, the Bay Area, San Francisco area. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They wanted to do something on Freemasonry. So they had me uh, dress up in that suit, Knight Templar suit I own. And, <laughs> and they put me on the moon with a, with a dog, and they put me in in an elevator whispering secrets to uh, Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton and then uh, they put me at Jonestown because of course uh, the conspiratorial conspiratorial minded thinks that the Freemasons are behind everything and (laughs) and every bad thing the world has to offer yeah so um yeah so there's a lot of going on. So I've been collecting that material. I've been interested in that stuff yeah. for a long time. And um, I, I realized that I had thousands and thousands of images and ephemera and things. I even had a, a nutcracker that was available from the Skull and Bone Society from Yale University. Um, <laughs> at, you know, that group that... Uh, George W. Bush and John Kerry belong to. There were two uh, skull and boners in the one election alone. <laughs> <laughs> Facing off for the presidency. Really remarkable. It's amazing. It's really amazing. Now, um, I just know, I don't know if you know this, probably you don't. Well, maybe you do. Um, I'm Portuguese. Um, my, you know, I was born in Portugal. And okay. uh, and and there is a lot. I mean, Portugal in itself—it's a, mer- a very mystical country. We have uh, an absolute um, uh, cornucopia of of you know um, uh, an abundance of uh, uh, not only the 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 Knight Templars, but we do have a lot of masonry and masonry, and and we do have the temples and all of that. And uh, there was even. Um, uh, some symbols that you know there's symbols everywhere i mean i but the city that i come from which is called tomar and that's t o m a r um it's basically it was thought of being the center of the night templars and at the, at the time when they actually existed um and in in the 16th century 14th century or 15th century but the thing is that there is a whole castle and um, the convent uh, in this little town in Portugal that everybody thought that it was, oh, it's just, you know, one of the places where the Templars were. Well, in fact, that was the center of the Templar uh, world at the time. Nobody knew. Still today, they think that that's just a little castle in the middle of nowhere, but um, <laughs> it's really not that, only that. And the, 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 the whole convent with its tunnels and secret chambers and all of that that were, uh, you know, explored later on had a lot of symbology that, you know, there was a lot of um, pil- pilgrimage of, of people related with the Templars and also related with uh, the Masons that went there to do measures of stuff. So, um, very interesting. What they were measuring, we don't know. But yeah. they were measuring something. <laughs> So, um, still today, the people go about their own business in this little town. Uh, Nobody knows. And the truth is that there's a lot there that um, a few people know that, that, you know, what really is going on in in that, behind those walls. So, when you talk about, and you talk about the Knight Templars in your... Uh, in in your book, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that also. And when we talk about secret societies, now what or, or secret brotherhoods? What are we um, talking about when we talk about secret societies? And what what are the the general characteristics that you found, um, especially in America? Obviously, because this is about America. Uh, what is the characteristics of a, of a secret society? I mean, how would you define that? Well, the book Ritual America, and that's the the book we're discussing. I yeah. I wanted to focus on something that I could. I mean, we could have. The trouble was uh, making it into a book size object because, and focusing it well enough so that it made sense. 
I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Freemasonry really goes back to Europe far, uh, far, lot longer ago than it came to America, which was uh, down the around the Revolutionary period time, yes, mm -hmm. 1700s, and then it goes way back. You know, the Freemasons claim it's thousands of years old, and a lot of people dispute that. They think um, there were Freemasons back at building the pyramids and all that, and they really like blowing up their history to that reference, or back to the Temple of Solomon in, uh, you know, Jerusalem and earlier. And so it's it really goes far back, and I want to focus this book on the American culture and how it influenced America and what was going on. During the Revolutionary War, of course, there were there were Masons in England, and we were at war with England. And so we, uh, the American Masons, were connected more with the Grand Orient type of Masonry, which was uh, mainly focused in France, also the, the Portuguese uh, connection there, too. Yes. Uh, so... Um, that, that was interesting, because uh, in American history, there's a, a General Lafayette, who's a Frenchman, who is, you know, if, without Lafayette, there would not be an America. There, this would still be a, uh, an English territory, a British territory, you know, yeah. without the connection, without the money, without stuff that was coming to us from France. And it started that way. With that French French connection, <laughs> not the dope connection like the movie, but the other type of connection. <laughs> yes. But, um. So, the, it, I, I found that fascinating to go back to early America and to see where where that picked up. W there was we were connected with a kind of a York style Freemasonry, which was also conducted in. Uh, England at the time. So what? What's going on there? It's uh, the the people belonging to the same order battling each other in a total war. It it made no sense to me. Yeah. And I, you know, they don't really. I mean, if you look at the books published by, you know, insiders or Freemasons themselves, they're not too good at articulating those things. It was very difficult to find reasons and wherefores about uh, how can you be in a opposing uh, wars and, and territories and still remain free Masonic brothers. How does that work? <laughs> so that was difficult, but I did bring it to America now. And the Civil War, of course, was a big, you know, North versus South, the Confederacy versus the Yankee Northerners, and um, a war, uh, and there are two major, you know, it, after the Revolutionary War in the late 1700s, Freemasonry became large. At one point, there was, there was a, it fell off, and I'll get into that, uh, well, I might as well do it now. It, it, after the um, Revolutionary War, the powerful and the people who signed the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, these people were primarily Freemasons. Uh, a number were not, but it was primarily Freemasonic concepts that were being explored in the Constitution and so on. And so you have to credit that to Freemasonry, the, that idea. And what is Freemasonry? Per se, and why does the Catholic Church hate Freemasonry and dislike and still have laws against people, Catholics belonging to Freemasonic organizations? Uh, one of the main reasons is that there was um, wars between the monarchy, the Catholic uh, Church, and um, uh, new uh, setups with the with the culture of the country, it, that was a battle because people who were Freemason, the whole Illuminati concept too, comes from a guy named Weishaupt, 
who is anti-Catholic, anti-monarchical. And that's the reason why he was thought to be, uh, the propaganda time thought he was extremely perverse in a horrible situation because he was not in favor of the, of the Pope and the papal laws mm-hmm. and the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. And it, there was uh, different, uh, you know, there were bankers who were more involved with the Freemasonic line. There were different uh, economic currents. There was the Catholic banks and the Freemasonic banks. And there are two different orders, and they battled each other, basically. And um, the uh, American culture started up with a, uh, uh, a non-Catholic uh, hierarchy through the, the masonry of the time. And that was interesting, because there was no other country like that. All, uh, Europe was primarily Catholic at that time and then the battles were uh there were civil wars like the french revolution was a civil war against the catholic hierarchy exactly. and yeah. it, it, so it's a difficult and very incredibly uh uh there's so much to this history and so much to look into pirates at one time were uh, connected with Freemasonry, uh, like the Scottish pirates, and then that that type of uh, Freemasonry in the United States, called the uh, uh, the Southern Jurisdiction of the um, of the Freemasonry down there. Uh, that so that that was basically they they called it Scottish Rite. And they call it Scottish Rite is connected with the Scottish Pirates. And the Scottish Pirates ran uh, uh, precious metals and monies all around uh, from Europe and other areas in the, uh, the, uh, the British Isles, too. And that was not the way it was supposed to be. It's sort of like today, if you're not Federal Reserve, you're out of the whole uh, situation. Yeah, and yeah. so in any case, all this is is a kind of a forgotten and suppressed concept of American history and what was going on, and that's fascinating. No, tell and, me um, one thing, Adam. Tell me one thing. I'm sorry to interrupt you. You yeah. said that we begin with the York style in yeah. masonry when we had um, the, the 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 Declaration of Independence. Now the document itself. Declaration of Independence, can we see in the writing or in the style of writing or in the things that are actually proposed in this document that we have Freemasons writing it? Uh, The only way you can really tell is whether the people who signed this document were uh, declared Freemasons. And so there's the, there is nothing in the style. There's nothing in well, you know. Well, historians will will say, well, th- this language is far more connected to the Grand Orient laws and what was going on in France at the time, and um, you know they it was connected to the concepts of Freemasonry, but they didn't make it like a Freemasonic law book. Yes. You know. Yes. It yes. was it was just influenced particularly yes. by yes. Freemasonry. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, um, you know, th- these are the things that I wanted to know. We have York style of Freemasonry in the starting of the of the of this nation of of the United States of America, as um, you know, of the Declaration of Independence when you know, the United States declared independence from the United Kingdom. Now, the thing is, uh, why, this is my experience. In Portugal or in Europe, for instance, in order for you to be part of the Freemasonry in there, and I'm not sure what I'm talking about because I don't, I really don't uh, know too much about it, but I do know that you're either invited in and you have to be a very special person. I mean, you have to be either 
in a very high place or you have to be like a remarkable scientist or remarkable on wherever you do either a politician you know uh, anything that would be extraordinary um, and probably money I'm not sure but you know you do have to have a brilliant mind now here in the United States I see that every single person can be a Freemason and every single person can actually belong to Freemasonry now I don't know if this Freemasonry that these people can you know be part of uh, it's really the Freemasonry or off little offshoots that came out of it but the fact is that I see Freemasonry <laughs> everywhere you know you see the symbols everywhere and you don't see this in Europe at all I mean my experience is that you, you when you see it it's like aha look there there's a Freemason you know symbol in that door uh, so it's like an awe when you see something like that because they're very secret is the Freemasonry lost a little bit of that secrecy in America with you know with with the with the with the current as we as we are now and and why is that I mean why everything is I mean I can see Freemasonry symbols everywhere well the, the American idea is one reason there are different reasons for it for this mm -hmm. what you're mm -hmm. thinking about you're absolutely right that the European style and the British style Freemasonry is far more exclusive. And uh, in the past, to even join Freemasonry, there was you have to be invited, even in the United States, you know, to mm. Freemason. Uh, they changed their tune when they started losing uh, uh, members <laughs> by the <laughs> flock, and so, and then then the requirements got lower and lower the bar got lower <laughs> as far as people who could join free masonic things but let's go back to the united states um and say what what was going on there and what is it was it freemasonry or what actually what's fascinating what i got into a lot in the book was uh i think freemasonry is like the mother the maternal thing the off it's sort of like the son and all the various other orders are sort of flocked out from it with Masonic concepts and Masonic rituals and Masonic things, but they didn't call themselves Freemasonry. They called themselves other things. They called themselves uh, Knights of Pythias, the Woodmen of the World. They called themselves uh, the Odd Fellows of America. They, there are hundreds of these actually literally hundreds of these types of organizations. I, I separated out exactly what these operations are, what the emblems or logos are Absolutely. in the book, yeah. Yeah. but what it means to belong. There are some that are very blue-collar, labor-oriented, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Teamsters Union, for example, that's a blue-collar union, but it's, it's, it's a fraternal brotherhood, you know? And then um, there's the, uh, many other type of labor unions that were based on that. There are ones for uh, people who worked in the railway, people who were clerks in the railway. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was all over the place, and you had to belong. Any labor union is basically a, a fraternal brotherhood mm -hmm. at, mm -hmm. at one point particularly. So, And then um, there were the occult orders. There are the... Um, the Christian orders, and at one point, even the Catholic Church, uh, at one, uh, particularly in the, this is the 1920s, I believe, and Freemasonry is so huge and so much a part of American culture that the Catholic, uh, you know, particularly young people, young Catholics, got extremely envious of that, and they wanted their own order <laughs> like the Freemasons. <laughs> Uh, and so the Catholic Church uh, constructed one for them called the Knights of Columbus. And that is the Catholic quasi-Masonic order. But to this day, the, the, the Pope has uh, invocations against belonging to a Masonic order. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the, um, so there the various types of orders, there were... There were burlesque orders. They call the burlesque order. They're people that made fun. There were 
orders for drinking. There are orders for teetotalers. There is orders for every type of person alive in the United States for all the various reasons. And, of course, in modern day, you know, when you got cars, for example, when you got suburbs, when you got uh, radio, you got television, uh, the whole society was set up differently, and the needs and the necessity for a, a kind of a fraternal brotherhood got less and less and less. And they started losing members and started losing their importance. And uh, now, today, there is a good reason for fraternal brotherhoods, particularly uh, with police, with the mil- people in the military, yeah. and defense industry. And we call that in the book the Brotherhood of the Gun. Yes. And yeah. uh, that, that it, 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 primarily in the United States now, People hooked up with the defense industry. People hooked up with the space industry. People hooked up with um, any kind of military or police type thing. Uh, those are the that is the hangover today of the primary uh, Masonic type organizations in America. Mm-hmm. Now, um, are th- are they still in crisis? Do you think? Because I know that the the health of of the of the masonry and and all of these little um, brotherhoods, very secret, uh, and and you know, uh, we can talk about Rosicrucians also in 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 uh, in Europe. Um, they're very much well in you know in very good health. I mean, they have lots of power. They're everywhere <laughs> you know you name it education health you know law um politics i mean they're everywhere and they are very very selective and i think that that's you know um i don't know if this is you know but the the other thing is that i think but looking at this york style of freemasonry they actually brought that from england i mean you know and they wanted to to kind of separate themselves when they did declare the independence they wanted to but they want that they they wanted that they didn't really abdicate of that um right. you know and, and that was something that connected them directly to england which is very interesting isn't it to think about that you know why did they continue to do i think that the, my question is what is really the fascination about belonging to these secret societies and brotherhoods what why do, do people join them did you find this out well who, who there was some was, was it woody allen or something that yeah he, <laughs> i want to belong to any organization that wouldn't have me you know <laughs> i think that's it it's the exclusiveness of it really yeah is major reason for that you know mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. uh now you they're they're searching for anybody who would join them so it's sort of like it's sort of trashy and lower common denominator you know yeah there's yeah. why bother you know right now <laughs> it's like these business organizations like the lions club or the optimist club and all that you have to say an oath to belong to these things so in some ways, it's sort of like a brotherhood. But people got very upset when I said I wrote in the book and categorized Rotary as a business a brotherhood. And I said, we're not a secret. It's nothing secret and all that stuff. But you have to say an oath to belong, don't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. It has a weird symbol, doesn't it? You... you go to group meetings at a particular time, and non-rotary people can't attend those meetings, right? Yeah, yeah, I guess. <laughs> but they get really upset when you say that, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, how many people did you upset with this book, Adam? <laughs> <laughs> I tried, actually, the fact is, I tried not to upset anybody. <laughs> I, 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 but I, I wasn't entirely successful at that. But the the whole thing was, is I wanted to tell the truth and, you know, not have any misinformation at all. And I would thinking that these groups that have really gone downhill and 
recent decades that they might like it if their their manner and their positions and what they are were mm-hmm. were discussed in a book like this about how important they were to uh, American history and why. Uh, but more than American history, there was a time at which, um, but we're talking about people getting upset about it, but the, yeah, I mean, some people belonging to Scottish Rite, they said, well, if you don't belong to the group, you have no right to to write about it or discuss it. And uh, I, I link that concept to, well, uh, Doris Kearns, I think her name is, wasn't the president of the United States. She had, she had no right to discuss the presidency, <laughs> 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 or or any anything like that. Yeah. You, you're not able to discuss it unless you are that. And then, if you are that, actually, how much are you going to reveal at all? Yes, exactly. and that yeah. you know. So uh, I, I couldn't take all that very seriously. Yeah, no, I I believe that you didn't. Now, one of the things that I it really surprised me, um, and let me see if I can see here in the book because I have to kind of pinpoint it. Um, let me see. It's it's about Lady Gaga, and I was like, what? Lady Gaga is in here. Uh, <laughs> I was like, what? Why did he put Lady Gaga here? So. Um, it's on the on the chapter six, Sons of the Desert, Famous Masonry in popular in popular culture, and you yeah. talk about brotherhoods in film and television, Lady Gaga, you know, televised fraternities. Um, I mean, you, you go down Brown and the Masons both. So, uh, Lady Gaga, uh, it's it's a very interesting thing because you know the, it's this is a very pretty recent pop star, um, big one actually. Um, that, um, oh, it's so ridiculous when people compare her videos and her stages, staging of, of her concerts and the lyrics and everything with symbols of the Rosicrucians and Illuminati and all of that. But she had a, actually a, 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 what you would call Illuminati dreams. How how did you describe that? I mean, what, what, happened, what happened with Lady Gaga? <laughs> I, I used her own language for that. Yes, uh, yes, you did. I didn't describe no. her thoughts, but the uh, no. but Lady Gaga and Lindsay Lohan, a lot of hip hop guys, they they there's kind of a little fad where they talk about Illuminati and so on, and then that Super Bowl thing with uh, Madonna too. Oh, Madonna. I think, yeah, yeah, uh, linked into. Uh, Quasi satanic, or at least Illuminati type ideas, and well, first of all, let's get to Illuminati. What does that mean? What is it? Yeah. What is it now? Uh, the Illuminati uh, was popularized in uh, recent decades by Robert Anton Wilson. He had this trilogy of novels called the Illuminatus, and they um, and. It was sort of like a he was really given to conspiracy theory concepts and blamed by various people or groups to what they didn't like about uh, the culture and and given uh, something for the fingers to point at and to blame. And then um, the Illuminatus mean like there were there was a hierarchy. There were important people who controlled the culture and any any uh, uh, rich person who controlled the culture uh, was often called an Illuminati like the people who controlled the uh, mass media in the in the World War two and people called them Jews right they, they <laughs> controlled the media and also people think there's Illuminati because the Freemasonry, uh, was accused by the Nazis of being uh, an Illuminati apparatus because they allowed uh, Jews to belong to the organization. So mm-hmm. in World War II days, that was Illuminati was a code word for Jews, basically. And then, um, but today, the Illuminati is also people who, uh, the corrupt people who... Uh, corrupt the culture and make 
young people think evil thoughts and do evil things, <laughs> and they tie that into um, uh, pop culture and pop videos and all that stuff. And of course, Lady Gaga is big in that world, and Lady Gaga's videos, um, you know, if things get big, of course, uh, that's the manipulation of the people in charge and to make people think a certain bad thing and be influenced by it. That's Illuminati yeah. today. Yes, yes. Now, yes. Lady Gaga did stuff that was, that had that Illuminati, Illuminati uh, to the blame factor connected to it. Uh, Madonna did. Uh, Lindsay Lohan even bought it. She bought into the whole idea and she considered there was a, 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 a stalker and she took photos of them and posted and tweeted about it as <laughs> the Illuminati's downstairs. Look, here he is. And um, so a stalker became part of the Illuminati. He looked like a, a poor schlub who was <laughs> just around her house. But in any case, um, also hip-hop guys, they, they, they bought into that. It's that feeling of exclusivity, of inner sanctum of people who control things people you have no control over um, and they will dictate your life and you can blame any failings you have on that or anything you don't like of the culture on that um, I think there's uh, plenty of things to blame but uh, in our society uh, things that are just not good for the world at, at large but I think it's it's a kind of a often, not entirely, often a laziness um, uh, to to simply point fingers and blame and call it this or that. You know. I know that you extensively in your um, book talk about uh, this, and you you go to each one of them. I mean, in the book is I have to say, I mean, I said it to you before we opened the microphone that um, this book is exquisite in quality. And, and then again, uh, we have to, to say that this is a Feral House uh, publication. It's absolutely amazing. I have it right here beside me, but um, I have it also in the table. It's a big book. Um, and uh, you, do, you go through all of these chapters, and it's a big, big book with uh, a lustrous, uh, very high-quality uh, paper. Um, and and the photographs are amazing. It's it's actually it says a visual guide. Now you go through everything. You you talk about the reason of Tubal Cain, the sons of the desert, as as we said, the pop 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 culture, the sex, death, clowns, and and clipped children. I mean, you, folk magic, cryptomasonry, and holding it. I mean, you have all of these chapters talking about sets and, and offshoots and, you know, and groups and brotherhoods. In your opinion, all of this, how did all of this, and I'm talking about since the, the, the York-style Freemasonry of the beginnings of America until now, how this, th did this shape this nation? Well, um... In what extent, you know? In, in various ways. Um, in various ways. One way it really shaped the country is that it provided um, communities and cities with things the government could not do or did not do at the time. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, insurance of various kinds, life insurance, medical insurance, uh, uh, meeting grounds for uh, the paternal, like the father's, <laughs> they would get together to ditch the screaming children at the family, you know, and go out and drink. Uh, it provided uh, entertainment for those. They, they always had these, uh, like they had these minstrel shows and other things that, that uh, entertained the community. There were things that was done that the business world did not do and that um, uh, and the government did not provide. Um, or even private groups like private hospitals. That's changed quite a bit since then, uh, since the uh, 19th century, 18th century, and the early 20th century. And, um, 
and then it got involved with the political realm. We, speaking of which, I every every political book about five Freemasons or or Freemasons, every book by Freemasons that touch on are we political? They say no, we are not political, and no way are we political. <laughs> but I found that was absolutely incorrect and provably wrong. Um, there was a lot of uh, Freemasonic politics uh, for 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 a long, long time. Um, as a matter of fact, I found in a Shriners magazine. Well, the Shriners is its own thing. Mas yes. Masons say we're not connected with Shriners. Well, you have to be a Master Mason to become uh, a Shriner. A, a master Mason is someone who passes the third degree. But they also, in the past, the Shriners expected you to pass the 32nd degree of the Scottish Rite to be able to join the Shriners. So they're absolutely connected with Freemasonry, and there are uh, Freemasons. There's just like a higher higher level of Freemasonry. You had to be a Freemason to join, and they didn't have as many specific learning type ritualism in the Shriners, but they had extraordinary amount of rituals in Shriners. It was, they thought, it, well, this is a drinking club, it's a fun club, and it's not this other thing. So that's one thing, it's like the Masons try to, uh, you know, tell you this is not that, or this is not what it, you think it is, or it's not, it's never. There's this use of a twilight language that you have to be an insider to know, an insider to say, and then if you're an insider, uh, you're not going to say anything, because that's <laughs> your role, your role is yeah. not to say anything, it's yeah, to be yeah. secret about it. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Now, as far as we know, Adam, as far as we know, uh, what is going on inside of masonry? I mean, I, we know that they have beautiful rites of initiation. Um, the Shriners actually had brutal <laughs> rituals of initiation, and they actually picture it in various posters, um, yeah. you know, with with the black eye and the, you know, and the band aids and all of that. And they actually, you know, they actually claimed it um, as 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 it was as it was. But um, but what 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 is really going on in in, in masonry? What what is that? Is that a religious? I mean, a, 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 a cult. What is what is going on inside of that? Well, as far as it, we know. It, well, I the way I well, there are two different things going on. There's a sense of a, a belonging that you have yeah. to do this to be an insider, mm -hmm. and but to become an insider, you have to do things that are threatening, threatening, and dangerous to you. So you become a better insider. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But then there are all these uh, various issues. Let's say the 32 degrees yes. of uh, the 30 uh, of, of Scottish Rite Freemasonry. Uh, each order, each level of that hierarchy. And by the way, they don't call it a hierarchy, which is strange. They say things that have like they seem perfectly obvious, but they say it's not what it is. You know, I. I <laughs> don't understand their objections on that level. I said, there is no such thing as a hierarchy. But in any case, the, um, the, you, learn, you go through all these rituals, and they're beautiful. There are paintings and draperies and, and uh, rituals with the, you know, that you're supposed to repeat and be marched around and do certain things to, to, join, to encompass that concept of what it is. Now, Scottish Rite... Uh, Freemasonry, all its modern day rituals were invented and written by a guy named Albert Pike. Albert Pike was a Confederate general during the Civil War. Albert Pike's ritualism, he, he, he gets it for a lot of different sources, some extremely occult in, in their, the way they're structured. Um, he got a lot of his rituals and basically plagiarized the writings of Eliphas Levi. Eliphas Levi wrote books on the occult and the history of magic. And certainly from those books, some of those 
Scottish Rites rituals emerge from. Um, that, that's pretty amazing, considering you, you, there are pictures like photos of Aleister Crowley, who, you know, people say, oh, so he's a black magician, he's this, he's that. Um, but that's another story about Aleister Crowley. But Aleister Crowley <laughs> said in a past life he was Eliphas Levi. <laughs> yes, that's so, what he said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so Eliphas Levi, he was he he, uh, he what his writings were were adopted by Albert Pike, the Confederate general. Um to to uh, be the the basic source material for Scottish Rite initiation ideas. And that's pretty amazing, the connection between occultism and Scottish Rite uh, Freemasonry. Mm -hmm. Do mm -hmm. I think that's bad? No, I don't think that's bad at all, personally. But a lot of people do, like Christians and, you know, well. Bible... Bumpers and so on. Well, yeah. I think that those um, Bible, Bible uh, you know, Christians or whatever it is. I mean, the, the <laughs> there's a lot of things going on right now about you know, uh, not only you know, you know, religion, but Christians have an uproar uh, right now about you know, and because we have elections coming up and, and all of these things coming up, so there's a lot of uh, very strong opinions in both sides. I should say and um yep. yeah but uh yeah but the, you know it's about power do you think that it's about power adam it's about power all of this of course it's about power of a yeah. absolutely no kidding yeah <laughs> <laughs> so the, the 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 this whole thing to say that um that we're talking with uh, adam paffrey um, he wrote uh, Ritual America, Secret Brotherhoods and Their Influence on American Society, a visual guide. So if um, you want to buy it, you can just go on um, feralhouse.com and uh, get a copy of this. It's a hard cover and it's absolutely oh. amazing, the quality. Go ahead. Sorry. It's also on Amazon if you want oh, it to is. find yeah. the Ritual America. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's the quality of this book is unprecedented. I mean, it's just very very nice. Uh, you have very rare photographs in here, actually. You know, some of them are very interesting. And then you go and it's really. I mean, if you read this, you have a really pretty big um, uh, idea uh, about the you know so secret societies and brotherhoods in America. Now the other thing is, um, since when did that in God We Trust came into the $1 bills. Because that was not there. No, you know. no. It, I think that came in the 50s, actually, early yeah. 50s. Yeah. From yeah. what I understand. I, hmm. We don't say that particularly in the book, but what we did discuss is the Great Seal uh, yes. on the reverse of the dollar bill with the pyramid and the eye in the pyramid and, and where that came from. And that came, that's a Masonic concept uh, that came during the administration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, in the 30s, and he was a huge Freemason, and um, you, there are lots of photos of him doing uh, cornerstone rituals here and there and everywhere. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's amazing what that is, too. It's really uh, amazing, and you do have that, I mean, the whole book is really uh, amazing oh here's lady gaga talks about illuminati dreams so um it's it's a fascinating book uh and how the other thing that because of your connections and you do talk about this in the in the book how big is this in the in la and in the film industry and all of this i mean how big are the masonry and secret brotherhoods uh is there any secret brotherhood specific to the motion pictures industry and television and all of that. They're, they're a lot bigger in the 20s and 30s and 40s. Than now. <laughs> now, early 50s. Also, the, uh, the silent movie actor, Harold Lloyd, was in charge of the Scottish Rite, and he was on covers of Time magazine doing that. But, the, um, but as far as today, far less. People don't want to... It's too much trouble for people 
they don't, people don't want to read books. They don't want to go through the. They don't want to learn things to pass the the, the rituals to uh, get into the next level of a Scottish ride. People are too lazy for that, <laughs> and that's one of the biggest problems. And they've reduced the requirements for belonging to these organizations quite a bit. Like uh, as I said before, in the past you had to be a thirty second degree. A Scottish right to even get into the Shriners. Now they say it's masters in masonry. Also, the <laughs> Scottish right, the Scottish right, for example. Mm. Uh, I have a friend in the Waxahachie, Texas area. He he runs an art gallery out there that has a lot of these banners and uniforms and things. He was very helpful for me in the book. But uh, that's a, a, a community out, about 20 minutes outside of Dallas. And they, um, in any case, uh, he says he's going through this weekend ceremony, one weekend, to become from a third degree to 32nd degree. That wow. used to take months and years to do that. <laughs> now it's a weekend. Wow. So there you go. That's what it is. I mean, it's. It's really reduced from what it was in the past. That's for sure. What is what is your opinion, Adam? Are we are we decreasing the? Uh, I mean, are we are we adapting to the times, or does this mean that we are so desperate that we don't really want this to die that we have to reduce the standards um, to fit uh, and to accommodate people? What do you think? Well, it's yeah, it's. You know, you, you will see that a lot of lodges are just being torn down. You know, in the past, like the turn of the 20th century, they, people they, there's so many different buildings throughout a, a town or a city. Just look for them. There are the odd fellow. There's the odd fellows building. There's the woodman building. There's this uh, uh, order and that order, and they'd have their own buildings and. Uh, now they're being torn down or turned into yeah. something else. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In Seattle itself, where I'm near, the the Oddfellows building turned into a restaurant called Oddfellows because they want to like hip it up. <laughs> 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 but there's the Oddfellows symbol, the the th the three links and the weird eye, and uh, but that that's now a a, a, ca a hip cafe. You're no longer doing the rituals. It's no longer meeting with odd fellows there. It's um, so people are desperate within these groups to keep it going. And uh, I must say that if you go to Washington D.C., it's really worth going to these different uh, major Freemasonic facilities just to see how much money they poured into these buildings, how huge and how incredible they are. Yeah. Um, it, it just you just go wow. This was so big, so meaningful. It was the the real and only thing at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we hope, we do hope that that it, it it's still today in a, in a small dimension now and small reduced. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. you know, truthful. I'm I'm sure that there are people who are passionate still about it and. And they do the rights, and they do everything, you know. Um, and I'm sure that there are, um, you know, those who consider themselves the hardcore, and those who are, you know, pro, you know, modern times, and they, oh, we don't need, we just do it in a weekend, um, you know. So yeah. I'm sure that there are there are always the hardcore people on on it. Well, Adam, thank you so much for being on Witch Talk and and kind of share your ideas with us and uh, talk about your uh, incredible book, uh, Ritual America. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It's Again. wonderful. So don't go anywhere, Adam. I will be talking to you in a, in a little bit. I'm just going to close the, 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 um, the show and then I will be with you in a, in a little while. Okay? Just a second. Okay. All right. Don't, don't hang up. All right. So, um, thank you very much. So, here we are. Uh, this was uh, one more episode with uh, Adam Parfrey uh, on his book, Ritual America. This is the end. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, on the chat room. Next week, we'll 
be back with more Witch Talk for you. Until then, have a wonderful, wonderful week. Bye-bye.